You know, we certainly do have a lot to give thanks to our God for, a lot to be joyful about. And you know, this is a time of the year that, that I really enjoy. You know, as the, as the days get longer, the weather begins to get warmer. It's a time when we're able to get outside and do a little bit more. But, you know, especially tonight, I'm just so thankful that there's nobody distracted by any sport events that might be going on somewhere else. <laughs> tonight, we're going to be in the 100th Psalm, if you'll turn there with me. It goes right along with the, the songs that we've been singing about being thankful to our God, having joy in what He's done, having joy in who He is. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. Psalm 100, beginning in verse 1. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good, His loving kindness is everlasting, and His faithfulness to all generations. This psalm really outlines the attitude that we ought to have toward our God. As he starts off, the psalmist begins in verse 1, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Our response to the Lord for all that He's done for us, for all that He's given us, should be to shout to Him, not to be a, a half-hearted, well, thank you, Lord. You know, and, and, and you know, sometimes that's, if we're not careful, if we're not paying attention to what we're doing, we can sing that way, well, thank you, Lord. For, you know, we can get to be not really paying attention to the, the message that we're singing, the one that we're singing to. But he says here, shout joyfully to the Lord. And our response should be one of, that's not half-hearted, but, but completely sold out for God. Our joy in being His isn't something that we should be able to contain. Just thinking about who He is and what He's done. Not least of which is the fact that He saved us from our sin. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, said, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Think about what He makes us there. When I think about myself, and I think about my sin, and I think about my wretchedness, and I think because of Jesus, He's made me the righteousness of God. How amazing is that? As the psalmist says, shout joyfully to the Lord. The more we think about what He's done, how can we not? The prophet Jeremiah got to a point where he didn't want to speak about the Lord anymore. At one point, turn with me if you will. Look at Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. And I'll begin for the sake of context reading in verse 7. So get an idea of what Jeremiah was dealing with. He says, O oh Lord, you've deceived me, and I was deceived. You've overcome me and prevailed. I've become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. You see, his preaching wasn't very well received. Each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction, because for me the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. But if I say I'll not remember him or speak any more in his name, at times it sounds like Jeremiah decided, I don't want to do this anymore. But notice what he says here at the end of verse 9. He says, In my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. His preaching wasn't always well received. But he couldn't hold the message back. He had the message of Almighty God. And when we consider what God's done for us, how can we do anything but Shout joyfully to Him. Proclaim how wonderful He is, and that's the purpose that our God has given us. He's made us the most blessed people on the planet. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, he says, For you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. He's made us, God, God has made us His very own people. And He's given us a purpose, He says, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. 
and considering the blessings He's given us, making us His own people, giving us fellowship with Himself, giving us, although we're sinners, giving us a righteous standing. How can we not want to, as the the psalmist says, shout joyfully to the Lord? Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. But he goes on from there. He's not just talking about uh, shouting about it. He says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. He goes on. He talks about doing service to the Lord. and In Acts chapter 17, Verses 24 and 25. While Paul is in Athens and on Mars Hill, he's describing to these pagans who are there who have these idols to anything and everything you can imagine. He sees an altar there to an unknown God. He says, I'm going to tell you about him. And he proceeds to proclaim the gospel to them, to tell them about the God who is the creator of the universe, the one and the only. And he says to them, the God who made the world and all things in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. The psalmist says there, serve the Lord with gladness, but what we find out is we're not serving God because He needs it. Our God is such that He doesn't need anything from us. We serve Him because we love Him. We serve Him because of who He is, because of what He's done. We serve Him because we want to. We serve Him because He's worthy. But as we consider how to serve Him, just a brief note, Jesus was speaking in Matthew chapter 25 and talking about the judgment. He says that we serve Him by serving those around us. He says also in that verse in the psalm that we come before Him with singing. Mentioned there right after He talks about serving the Lord, we come before Him with singing. And that's such an important thing that we do each each week, that we sing to our God, that we sing thankfulness to Him. We sing praise to Him. We sing about His worthiness. But are we really thinking about what we sing? Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul writes that we are to let the Word of Christ dwell richly within us in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. But it's imperative of us as we sing to Him, as we come before Him with singing, that it's a wholehearted singing, that it's an attentive singing, that we are paying attention to the words that we sing. You know, as Gene led us just a few minutes ago, we were singing about our God and how we want Him to reign forevermore, how He will reign forevermore, but are we thinking about that as we sing it? This morning we sang a song, Oh, How I Love Jesus. But are we thinking as we sing those words about how much we love Him, about why we love Him, why He's worthy and deserving of our love? Come before Him with singing, but let's do it attentively. Not just as a ritual, not just going through the motions, but do it because we love our God. Come before Him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Know the Lord. As the Apostle Paul recounted all of the things that he had, all of the things that he could boast about in this life as he was writing the letter to the Philippian church.
He says to them, that if anybody could put confidence in the flesh, oh, I could put far more. And he goes on, Paul goes on to share with them, you might say, his, his resume of faithfulness and Judaism. Talking about, I'm from this tribe and I was a persecutor of the church as to zeal. And he goes on and he explains, here's what I could boast in. But he says, whatever things were gained to me, those I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Philippians 3 and verse 8, he says, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, from whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. He goes on to say that he wants to be found in Him, not having a righteousness that comes from law, but the righteousness through faith in Christ. In verse 10, he says, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. Paul's desire, we see there more than anything, he says, I could boast in all of these things, but it doesn't mean anything next to knowing Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what really matters. The psalmist says there, know the Lord. When Jesus is questioned, teacher, what's the great commandment in the law? As the religious leaders of the day were trying to trip him up, they said the greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul with all your mind. And the mind deals with knowledge, with understanding, that we are to understand who He is, what He desires from us, and that takes effort. To know the Lord is not something that just happens on its own. It's not something that's going to happen by accident. It takes our effort, it takes our time, it takes our focus. We're to love Him with all the mind to get to know Him. He's our Creator. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's the source of all good. But knowing Him, as we consider what does it mean to know the Lord, it's more than simple head knowledge. It's more than an academic exercise. Now don't misunderstand me. We need to know what's in Scripture. We need to get to know as much as we can about God. But knowing God is more than just knowing about God. It's a relationship. Knowing God is to be a child of God. To know what it's like to come up from the waters of baptism knowing that our sins are left behind. Being able to call Him Father. It's more than just knowing a set of facts about who He is. We know facts about our favorite actors, our favorite athletes. I'm sure that some of you in here have been looking up facts and statistics about your favorite athlete who's probably playing tonight. But there's no relationship there. We need to both know about and relationally know our God. As we consider knowing Him, one of the greatest blessings, as I mentioned there, is we get to be a child of God. Paul writes to the Roman church in Romans chapter 8 that we get to address Him as our own Father. In Romans 8 verses 14 and following, <clears throat> he says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. What a privilege. What an awesome blessing. But He doesn't even stop there. He says, and if children, 
heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may be glorified with Him. As children of God, we have an inheritance in heaven to look forward to. God invites us to know Him, to be a part of His family, to be His. And inasmuch as we have obeyed the gospel, we've been bought at a price, and we're not our own. We are His, and we are to glorify Him in our bodies as a result. The psalmist talks about how we shout joyfully to Him. We're to serve Him, to sing to Him, to know Him. But he continues on, Psalm 100 and verse 4. As he builds, it just gets better and better. Shout to Him. Serve Him. Know Him. And enter into His presence. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. We have the wonderful privilege of God's children. Of being able to go to Him, to address Him, of having the promise and having the assurance of being able to spend eternity with Him. The Hebrew writer speaks about the privilege we have of being able to go before Him whenever we need to. In Hebrews 4 and 16, or excuse me, I'll back up to verse 14 there, Hebrews 4, verses 14 and following. He says, Therefore we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can draw near to our God. We can come into His presence. We can approach Him directly. In all of history, that's not always been the case. After the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and came to Mount Sinai, they were given the law. Moses was given instructions about how to build the tabernacle. Very specific instructions. And among those, he was told that there's to be the holy place and the most holy place. And separating those is to be a veil. No one except the high priest one time a year, and only with blood to atone for sin, is to enter the most holy place. Because you see, that's where God dwelt. That was the symbolic dwelling place of God among His people. And because sin had not been taken care of, people couldn't enter the most holy place. They couldn't come into the presence of God. as Jesus hung on the cross, it says He cried out with a loud voice and He breathed His last. And the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Sin had been paid for in full. There was a way to God, a way to be in His presence, and we can now approach Him directly. But as the psalmist says, we enter into His gates with thanksgiving, enter His courts with praise. We don't enter in an apathetic or a casual way. This is not just any old individual that we're going to see. This is our God. This is the Creator of the universe, the One who saves us. We come with praise, with thanksgiving. Praise for what He's done in giving us every spiritual blessing. For giving us status as children of God. For giving us mercy and grace. For giving us an inheritance in heaven. For giving us His Holy Spirit which guarantees our inheritance in heaven. We come before Him with praise and with thanksgiving because He has done everything for us. James tells us in chapter 1, 
that every good thing we have is from Him. We don't come before Him in a casual way, but we come before Him understanding what a privilege it is. We come before Him thanking Him and praising Him. But as we draw to the end of the psalm, He says there we're to shout joyfully to the Lord. Why? To serve the Lord with gladness. Why? Know that the Lord Himself is God. Why do we want to know God? Why do we want to shout to Him? Why do we want to have joy? Why would we want to serve Him? Why would we want to enter His presence? And He answers that question as He comes to the conclusion in verse 5. For the Lord is good. Why would we want to do all of these things? It's all grounded in who God is. It's rooted in His goodness and His character and who He is and what He's done. Because as we look throughout Scripture, everything that our God has ever done and everything that He is, is good. Beginning in Genesis chapter 1, when God created, it says over and over, God saw what He created and it was good. It comes to the end of the chapter and God looked at everything He created and it was very good. In Acts chapter 10, as Peter is speaking about Jesus and who He is and what He's done, he recalls Jesus, he speaks about Jesus as one who went about doing good. Whenever the Holy Spirit comes to live within us and we choose to be led by God through His Spirit, The Spirit bears His fruit within us among other things. What that does is it creates within us, or rather He, the Spirit, creates within us goodness. All that God is and all that God does is good. And so to answer the question, why would we shout with joy to Him? Why would we serve Him? Why would we be glad to serve Him? Why would we sing to Him? Why would we want to know Him? Why would we want to be in fellowship with Him in His presence because of who He is? And it goes on to say that His love endures forever. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. Because He will never stop loving you. We can choose to walk away from Him But it doesn't mean that He stops loving us or wanting us to come to Him. As we consider what the psalmist writes in Psalm 100, what we see is that our God is and has been immeasurably good to us. And all you have to do to see that is just look around a little bit. To see the physical blessings He's given us. Of homes to live in cars to drive, to look at the spiritual blessings He's given us, grace and mercy, peace with God. He's given us His Spirit. Look around and you see the blessing He's given us in a church family. He's given us more blessings than we can even recognize. Our God has been immeasurably good. He's blessed us more than we can comprehend. Why wouldn't we have joy in serving Him? Why wouldn't we be glad to serve Him? Why wouldn't we want to know Him and to be in His presence? This is the God who sent Jesus Christ here, His Son, to die on your behalf. If you're not in fellowship with Him, don't you want to be? And if not, why wouldn't you? And if you're not, you have the opportunity tonight. If you are a Christian, but you've wandered away, He stands ready to forgive. The Apostle John writes that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us. If you've never obeyed the Gospel, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you confess that belief, You turn away from your sins. 
and you're immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, you have the promise from God Almighty that He will remove every sin you've ever committed and you will be His child. For a God that's been so good and has given us so much and loves us to such an extent, don't you want to be in fellowship with Him? And if you need to make your relationship with Him right tonight, if we can help you in that, would you do so while we stand and while we sing?